He has done great things See what our Savior has done See how His love overcomes He has done great things He has done great things Oh, Hero of Heaven, You conquered the grave and break every chain, oh God You have done great things Be dancing your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus, our Savior Your name lifted high, oh God You have done great things Yes and amen You will do great things God, you do great things Oh, hero of heaven You conquered the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh, God You have done great things Be dancing your freedom week um, you know we talked about the relationships and sometimes how we have to have healthy boundaries sometimes we have to say no and it's okay to say no it's okay to have healthy boundaries um, those of you that are joining online um, 
if you have not watched uh, last week's service, I just want to go back and encourage you to go back, watch it. I think it'll benefit you greatly. Uh, those of you that were here last week and need a refresher, go back and watch last week's message. Um, now, today I want to talk about um, when we think about the word relationship. Sometimes, though, when we talk about um you know, family or relationships, some people cringe because they have a bad experience or they're going through a bad time in a relationship. Uh, some people, you know, you can have a, we look in the Bible and we see great examples of relationships. Some were great. Some were heaven sent. And other ones are from the pit of hell, right? Things in the Bible, everything that we go through, we look in his word, and there's an example of it. Wayward kids, parents that were bad influences on their kids, family members that were going against each other, family members. We see it all in the Bible. There's no lack of relationship information that we can gain and learn from in the Bible. Uh, today, though, I want to focus our attention on three groups. Children parents, and family. Now, I know that some of you are probably sighing, going, oh, do I really want to hear this? Sometimes we need to hear it, right? Sometimes uh, we don't have to have a terrified look on our face. I believe it's a good subject. It's something that we can all learn from. I know when I was preparing for this message and I was uh, reading through God's word, it was speaking to me about my relationships, and it helped me reflect on my relationships that I was going through, that I have now or in, in the past. You kind of, I think we all kind of evaluate relationships and where we stand, uh, whether current family members or past family members or friends or whatever that looks like. The good news is God is on our side for healthy relationships within our families. He wants our Families to have healthy relationships. Nowhere in Scripture does God say, no, stay away from your family. No, he designed us for that. He designed us to live together and to help each other, um, and to guide us. Now, it is, as a disclaimer, um, I'm no expert on parenting. Um, I am no expert on parenting family, uh, or being a child, because um, if you ask my parents, they'll let you know that I was pretty challenging at times. I mean, I know it's hard to believe, but, but you know, um, we can turn to the expert, though. We can turn to his word, and he can teach us about relationships. He wants to teach us about relationships. And if you would, turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, God has given the Israelites the instructions for obedience, forbidding idolatry, and the Ten Commandments. So, they're, they're, he's wanting them to get into the promised land, but he's like, I need you guys to follow my instructions. And a lot of times, have you ever put something together and you put the instructions, they take it out of the box and you put it off to the side? Because you think you know what it's going to be like? Oh, I can do this. It's not that complicated. Right? And then you're about halfway through and you're like, why doesn't this fit? Or what happened to that? Like, I'm, am I missing a piece? Guess what you forgot to do? Read the instructions. I've learned over the years because I have put stuff together and had extra pieces that I need to follow instructions. God has given us an instruction manual on relationships. We don't start out, we shouldn't start out and be like, oh, now I'm in a big mess and I got all these extra pieces and, you know, this bookshelf is now crooked. <laughs> you know, we shouldn't wait until we're halfway through before we read the instructions. God wants us to learn and to follow his instructions it's going to be much easier on us, right? If you would stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Again, we're in Deuteronomy chapter 6. 
It says, these are the commands, decrees, and laws of the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you were crossing, uh, you were crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God, as long as you live by keeping all of his decrees, commands uh, that I will give you, so that you uh, may enjoy long life. Here, Israel, be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Here, O Israel, the Lord your, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk to them when they sit at home and when they walk along the road. Uh, walk, yeah, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols around your hand and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. Amen. You may be seated. God was sending them into the promised land, but he is like, I'm not just going to leave you hanging. I'm not going to leave you just guessing. As, as a new parent, I remember when my son was born, I was like, okay, I don't know what to do. Like, I was afraid. Like, and I knew I should drop them, right? But what, what is it? That was the easy part. The easy part is when they're in the crib. But as they grow up, right, the challenging part now takes place. When they start walking and talking and telling you no, right, that's the challenging part. It doesn't end. It just keeps going. If history had followed these scriptures, though, we wouldn't have the problems within our families now. We wouldn't have the problems in, in the world now. If scripture, if they had followed the Lord's commands and his instructions. He wants to have a relationship around you, your family, your children, your parents. He wants that to be healthy. Family members that haven't talked to each other in years. Children that are disrespecting their parents. Feuds at funerals. I've seen fights at funerals, right? Right? Everybody gets along until somebody dies. And the heartache that it carries, time and time again, you see if you talk to people and you ask them, maybe they're, they're just having a rough time and they open up to you and they'll tell you. Yeah, well, I had a strange relationship with my parents or this or that, or I haven't talked to my brother in 10 years. You know, and you're thinking, why? What happened? Family dynamics. The devil wants to do nothing more than tear our families apart. And guess what we got to do? We got to fight like hell to keep them. That's what we have to do. Now I'm going to give us four things to chew on. Um, we're going to be like a cow today. I want you to chew on it. I want you to ingest it. I want you to regurgitate it. I want you to chew on it again. Okay? Because sometimes we hear some information and it goes nowhere. Sometimes we get information and then we ponder on it. Sometimes I'm, I'm an analyzer. You give me some information, I'll analyze it. Sometimes I'll analyze it too much. I'll analyze it to death. And then I'm thinking, overanalyze it. And then I think, oh. So you got to be careful. But I'm going to give you these four things. We must do it God's way. And we find out right there in Deuteronomy, God wants us to do it his way. Number two, we must set healthy boundaries. Number three, we must have effective communication. That's a big one. Communication breakdown will tear up a family in a heartbeat. And number four, we must love difficult people. Woo, we could just stop right there and talk about that. Difficult people. Anybody got any difficult people in your family? Right? No difficult people? Okay. And... Um, but think about that. Difficult people, sometimes 
we're the ones that's difficult, right? Sometimes we make it harder than it needs to be. Again, throughout this series, each week, I think God is speaking to us and how we can apply these things and his commands and his instructions in our lives and our relationships. So we all know that children can be challenging, right? Little bundles of joy. Like I said, when they're in the crib, they're good. All they do is cry. They want food. You hold them. They're sweet. They're innocent. They smell like baby, right? Um, but then at an early age, they start pushing buttons, right? They push buttons. And your prayer life increases. What am I going to do with this child? You know, they talk about the terrible twos and treacherous threes. It just keeps going, right? There's times when you're just like, I don't know what to do with this child, right? Um, whether it's your children or other children. Maybe you have some nieces and nephews and you're just like, I don't want them over my house, right? Maybe it's people like Billy. Have you ever had little Billies in your life? Well, if you haven't, I think you will, though. Once you watch this video, you're going to realize that, yes, I've got some Billies in my life. All right, class, my name is Mr. Drummond, and I'm going to be your substitute Sunday school teacher today. What huh? You, what you talking about? Well, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about. I'm glad you asked that question. We're going to talk about some big words. My dad says big words stunts our growth. Oh, well, you know what? Here's the great thing about these words. These are great words that'll help you grow in love. That okay. doesn't even make sense. Okay, all right. You know what? We're getting up the wrong foot here. Like I said, I'm a substitute. My name is Mr. Drummond. Let's just get to know some of you in this class. Well, what's your name? My name's Billy, like the goat. <laughs> but I'm not really a goat. No. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just a kid. You're not a goat. I'm a kid. You're not a goat. And you're not a teacher. Okay, all right, touche, touche, all right. But what I am is a tax accountant by, by trade, by day, but I volunteer at the church. Volunteering means that you step in. Dog poop! No, no. You step in dog poop! No, no, You're a dog don't. poop stepper! That's what you are! You step in. I smell it! No, Does Billy. anybody else smell it? Okay, I smell dog poop! Billy, wait, wait, wait! Oh no, it's on my hand. I got dog poop on my hand. I was playing with dog poop Billy, earlier. Smell, you want to smell it? Smell, uh, smell. Uh, <laughs> okay, put your, put, I, got a, I got a huge gag reflex. Please just put your hand down. <laughs> Good to know. Billy, Billy, look at me. Yeah, yeah. I don't, Billy, yeah. Shh, I don't want you. I don't, no, I don't no, want you. I don't want you. I don't want you. Hey, hey, I don't want you. Hey, hey, don't. Hey, don't. I don't, don't want you, want you to, put, to your put your hand your dog in poop your pan. hand. Dog poop. In my face. You said dog boob. Stop it. You stop, stop it. it. I am the teacher. I'm the teacher. No, you're an, I'm, I'm the teacher. The teacher the student. I'm, shh. I'm, I'm the teacher. I'm the teacher. You're the student. student. Stop, stop, it. It. Stop, stop, it. stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Big words. The first big word about love is eros. Class, can you say eros? That's not a big word. It is. It's a big word. Eros. I, I can say it. Eros. I just said it. Oh, eros. Why? Well, think... Like bows and arrows. No. That's not a big word at no. all. No. And I don't understand why you're teaching us about eros when it comes to love. Sunday school has turned rather dark this morning. No. Is this some kind of creepy love I'm unaware of? Is this the love that leads to war? No, Billy. Billy. Eros, um, it's not arrows like bow and arrows. It's er eros. It's E-R-O-S. You can't spell. No, I can. All right. It's a big word. Um, okay. It, it's basically, um, it's, uh, it's warm, gushy love. It's romantic love. Oh, Romantic love. Yes, yes. I like romance. Mm -hmm. It makes me feel funny inside. Oh, okay. right. <laughs> it makes me crazy. Uh -huh. You know what? Love makes me crazy, crazy right now. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Check this out right here. Slow it down. Uh, no, no, I don't want to get any of that. Billy, no. <laughs> don't touch me. I, it's okay. You're supposed to sign a form. I did. Bottom dotted line. We're good. We're I good. I don't know. We're good. I don't know. Just trust me. I don't know. We're good. I don't know. We're good. Creepy. No. Put the car in neutral. We're good. You good? Yeah. Okay. All right, you know what? I should not probably be talking about romantic love to 10-year-olds. To We're not 10. Huh? I'm five. Oh, dear. I'm five years old. Okay. Well, I like I like chicken nuggets, and I like chocolate. In fact, Miss Linda sometimes brings chocolate for our snacks. Did you bring chocolate? I did not. You are going to be a disappointment at best. Well, let, let me let me keep trying here, okay, Billy? All okay. right. Let me keep trying, all right? Okay. I'm just trying to, just trying to uh, figure out how to explain Eros love. <sighs> Look, I'll take this one. Oh. You may not know, Mr. D, uh -huh. but there's a holiday that is specifically just a set aside for romantic love. Yes. And it's all about arrows. And it's about a little chunky angel that flies around and shoots arrows right into people's hearts. And then they die, which is why it's called Valentine's Day. All right. Well, you're, you're, 
You're a quarter right on that. Hey, that's better than most days. All right. Um, let's just skip that. Let's, let's talk about the second big word of love. It's phileo. Blech. What? Phileo? Yes, phileo. Like phileo fish? No. That is the worst sandwich ever introduced to the best restaurant ever. Phileo fish? That is disgusting. You have to be an old person to like a phileo fish sandwich. You know why? Because phileo fish sandwiches smell like old people. All right, Billy, I need you to they stop. Do. Billy, Billy, they look up like here. Stop people. it, Billy. Billy, look up here. I win. I need you to stop and listen to me, all you right? You listen to me. No, it smells you, like no, old people. No, you listen to me. Yeah. I need you to stop it. Why, you stop, stop it. it. You stop it. Phileo is brotherly love, all right? Do you have any brothers? No, I don't. This love does not pertain to me. Okay, all right. I have sisters. Oh. I have five sisters. Uh-huh. And they're all demons. No, they're not. Yes, they no, are. No, they're not. You don't you, know them. No, you can't prove it. I'm the good one in the family. No, no. oh, you're the good one? Yes. Your mother must be so proud. Huh, she never says that. Mm. Mm. Getting a clearer picture. Okay, all right. You know, um, uh, you said you liked candy. Is that right? Candy? Yeah, I like chocolate. That's why uh, I said well, chocolate. Let me try to correlate phileo brotherly love with the candy that you like, that you love. Yeah, all right? Okay. Uh, what, tell me about the candy. What do you like about the candy? Well, that's a personal question. Oh, well, if, Especially for a Sunday morning. Well, if you can just be vulnerable for a minute. I'll open up to you, strange man. All right, thank you. I think what I like about the chocolate candy bar uh -huh. is that when you unwrap it, the wrapper is shiny and makes a crinkly noise. Great! And I like that when you break it up, it's in perfect little rectangles. Okay, great. And I like that when you hold it in your hand for a long time and it melts. Billy. And you open up your hand no. and then it looks like, it looks like dog poop! No. Smell! Oh, oh. <laughs> Turn down. <laughs> um, you know what? Forget, forget. You know, the, the, all the things that you mentioned about the candy, those are called attributes, which is another big word, attributes. But those are the things that you like about the candy. Now, I have a feeling that you have attributes when it comes to your best buddies and your grandma and your grandpa and even your sisters. There are, th there are attributes that you like about these people, that you love about those people, and that's what phileo brotherly love is all about. Yeah, I guess I guess there's some attributes that I have about my sisters. There you go. Yeah, I think I think I think I like it when they're asleep. Oh. That's the one attitude I have that I like about them. Okay. All right, let's move on because yeah. I think I think this next big word is going to cover all of that. Yeah. All right, and it's a great word, okay? Yeah. It's how God feels about us and it's called agape love. Agape. No agape. Agape. It's agape. I love this. I have agape at home. His name is Mr. Witherton, except my sister, she calls him Mr. Blitherton and it makes me angry. No, of course it does. Of course it does. All right, um, agape is not has doesn't have to do with your fish. Yeah. Um, all right, it's it's um, agape is God's crazy love for us. God loves us so much that He sent His one and only Son. You know, like the song. You know, Jesus loves me. This I know. Stop! Huh? Stop opening your mouth and what? letting musical type things come out of it. What, 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 it what? is awful. What's, what's You've a... destroyed that song forever. No. Never sing it again. What? what? Never. Uh, all right. Never. All right. All right, Simon Cal, you, you sing the song then. Okay, I will. All right. Jesus loves me, this I know. Oh, the Bible told me something about it. Uh -huh. Little ones to him forever. Uh -huh. They are tiny, but he is clever. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible said something about it one time. All right, again, a quarter right on the right, right on the dot there, buddy. I take right. that as a hundred percent. Yeah. All right. Um, very good, very good. Jesus' love, you know, it, it's it's a it's agape love. He loves us like we're his guppies. That's right. That's it. He lo God loves us like we're his guppies. There you go. There you go. You know, like your guppy, you love your guppy. Your guppy can't do anything for you, but you love it. You take care of it. That's the same thing with God. He loves us. You know, he takes care of us. You know, we can't do anything for him, but he allows us to choose him. All right, agape love. What's, what's the matter? What did I say? What's the matter? What's the matter? What, what, what's when right? we die, is God going to flush us down the toilet? No, no, Billy. This is the worst Billy. love ever. Billy, no, no. Whoa. Billy, Billy, I'm sorry. Wait, don't touch. Don't touch. Billy, I'm sorry. Stop. Don't touch me there. This is my no-no square. You watch a lot of Dateline, don't you? My mom lets me stay up too late. Oh, dear. We don't have a lot of boundaries in my house. <laughs> That's, I'm... I watch HBO. I just, I just need you to be quiet. 
I just need you to be quiet. It's a challenge for me. Oh, we're going to have to get you some counseling. You're, you're a future visit to Dr. Phil just waiting to happen, aren't you? I've already got my tickets. You poor child. All right, let's, let's go back to this because maybe this will cover all of that. Agape love is God's crazy love for you. And yes, oh, we're like just guppies. And God loves us so much that he takes care of us. And he wants us to love him back. We get to choose to love him back. Unconditional agape love. You know what? What? I'm starting to have agape love for you, Mr. D. Well, thank you. Yeah. Guys, Thanks, I Bill. love you, but you can't do anything for me. Okay. You're well. a horrible teacher. You've got a strange fish odor about you. All right. And I haven't understood a thing you've said. Okay. And yet I still love you. Thank, thank you, Bill. High five. No. Dog poop on the oh. hand. <laughs> I would say little Billy's a character, huh? Yeah. Can you imagine what he's going to be like when he grows up? Um, do you have family members that are little billies? Or maybe they're big billies? And if you can't really think of a billy in your, in your family, maybe you are the billy, right? Um, if you are a billy, just see me after class, okay? We need to talk. You need Jesus and we need to talk. Um, you see, though, friends, neighbors, and acquaintances... Um, no matter how close you get to them, okay, they're not family. There, there's this, you know, there's a time when certain distances, and let's face it, at the end of the day, when you're with family, you close the door behind you, and they're in front of you, right? They're in your house. They're in your family, and you see them probably pretty often. Now, when it comes to family, the devil, like I said, wants to do nothing but to divide our families. And when he does that, he wins the battle. He doesn't win the war. He just wins that battle. And what he does is he goes after your family and your family and your family. And he keeps going after families and trying to tear everybody apart. He tries to do it. And it's not just in the secular world. He's after the families in the church. He wants the families in the church to be divided. You know, when we had the pandemic, there was families that got divided over wearing a mask. They were just, I mean, they didn't want to talk to each other. They didn't want to see each other because one person would wear a mask. The other one was like, I'm not wearing one. Divided. I mean, now we don't have to look very hard in, in Scripture to see that the first family had dysfunction. Cain and Abel. I mean, it was real, real quick in the Bible. We turned to the very front, a few pages in, and there was dysfunction because sin had entered the world. Now, I don't know about you, but when you think of a parent as successful, uh, we discover the answers we often get when we look and we say, you know, what is success? If I, if I raise my kids right, and they don't turn into, you know, a drug addict or an alcoholic or, or you know, they're a criminal or whatever, then is that success? Or are we looking at, oh, if I raise my kids and they become a doctor or they become a lawyer or they become, they, you know, they have a, a certain social status, then is that success? Or is it that they honor their mother and father? We have to ask ourselves, what do we think? Success is teaching our kids. Some people think that success as a parent is, is you're never going to, if you give them everything they want, then that's successful. No, you're not setting boundaries, healthy boundaries for your kids. What happens when they grow up? Some people think, well, if I'm, if I'm successful and I have enough money, then I can give my kids everything they want. Well, you can buy them all the stuff you want. Is that going to help them in life? No. You have to have healthy boundaries. There has to be healthy things. God even said in his word, I want you to teach your kids these things. Teach them. We often discover that through the biblical lens for success, parenting looks different. The goal of parenting, or at least in the Bible perspective, is to create space of opportunities that you're going to teach your children, regardless of their age, to see the existence and goodness of God in the world. 
See, what happens is, I remember when I was a little kid and, and I was on a baseball team, and our baseball team, we were terrible. We were terrible. We won one game the whole season. We were the happiest kids on earth, but we only won one game. But we knew what losing was. We knew what it was, because just about every week we went out, we lost, right? And now, they don't keep score. Everybody gets a participation award. That's not teaching kids. Because what happens is they become adults, and they've never lost anything. They don't know what it is to lose a game. And what happens? They don't get that promotion, and they freak out. They have a meltdown. Why? Because they couldn't handle it. They didn't know how to lose. They've never lost anything. They never got passed by anything. That's not healthy. In your children's life, you are the instrument that God wants to use to communicate and teach the important things of children. The character, the love, the grace, and the plan of God in their life. You are the one. You can't rely on the church to do it. You need to be the one to help your kids. And even if they're adults, guess what? You can still impart into your kids, no matter what their age is. It is essential that we craft our families after Deuteronomy 6. In this passage in Deuteronomy 6, it's an essential task that is assigned to every parent, that we must teach our kids. We must show them that there's going to be heartache. There's going to be times when, you know, you lose. It's not the church's responsibility, the government's responsibility, or the school. It's not even the village. God has given us, as parents, the responsibility to teach our kids. Every single one of us is designed to teach our kids. No matter what our age is, whether we adopt kids or whether we have them biologically, you were chosen for the task. You just have to make sure that you're, you're getting in God's word and you're giving them good advice. You were chosen to lead your kids spiritually, and that's what really matters. What you're doing is not in vain. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. You might not see the fruit now from your kids. Keep praying. Keep believing. Because if you've imparted that in your kids when they're young, guess what? They will not depart from it. They will come back. They'll know the truth. Looking for teaching lessons all the time. I remember my dad, he was a mechanic, and he loved, I loved to just, he would sit me in the inside of his 67 Chevy pickup truck because, you know, there was a lot of space in those vehicles back then. And I would just sit up there, and I would watch him wrench on his truck, do different things, and ask a million questions. And my dad had patience to answer all those questions. Like, what does this hose go to? What does this wire go to? What is this? Like, my dad would teach me, right? And I didn't become a mechanic, but he was just, he was patient with me, he was kind with me, and he was, hey, he was just showing love in the things that I was asking a million questions for. You gotta be careful. You can't protect your kids in a bubble. Because like I said, what's gonna happen is they don't become good losers. They don't know how to react. They don't know how to evaluate pain when they've got pain. Pain's going to be inevitable. Kids are going to fail. They're in life. Life happens. But if you're not teaching your kids and you're not there teaching them that, hey, they can come to you and they can come to God as support, you're not teaching your kids anything. Because guess what? Bubbles burst. You can put your kids in a bubble and, and try to keep them from the outside world and everything's going to be great. But guess what? If you're not careful when that bubble bursts and you're not around, what's going to happen? Who are they going to turn to? Are they going to turn to the world? Or are they going to turn to you? Turn to God. You have to ask yourself, what am I teaching? We have these strained relationships even with adult children. Your little billies, 
But I can tell you one thing, no matter where your kid's at in their relationship with God and their relationship with you, prayer works. Prayer works. You pray for your kids, you pray over your kids, whether they're, you're in your house or they're not. You pray because it works. When you get on your hands and knees and you turn to God and you say, you know what? I can't speak to them. I can't talk to them. They won't listen to me. You know what you pray? You pray that God will send somebody in their life that they will listen to. It could be a boss. It could be a coworker. It could be someone else. Because how many times have you talked to your kids and you tell them something and they just stare at you? They don't listen, or at least you think they don't listen. And then someone else comes along, another adult or whatever, and they tell them the exact same thing that you've been telling them for 10 years. And all of a sudden, there's this revolution. Whoa. And you're like, I've been telling you that the whole time. But listen to somebody else, but they won't listen to you. Relationships, they're strained. They're broken sometimes. Sometimes when you have little billies, though, the atmosphere changes, right? But I'm going to tell you, if you pray, you can make that phone call. You can make that communication. Open up that line of communication. Go knock on their door. Ask God, how will you lead and guide me to restore a relationship? Because God doesn't want to see your broken relationship stay broken. Amen? And I'm going to repeat, well, like I said last week, is you got to be a constant in their life. Parents, if you were looking to be a perfect parent, right? You're not going to be. And every time, it, it, you know, as, as difficult as teenagers are, they can even be more difficult when they reach adulthood. And sometimes we're disappointed and sometimes we're, we're just angry and we're mad and we're like, what do I do? Now, I've read the Bible cover to cover, but guess what? I've never found one perfect parent. So don't beat yourself up because you're not going to be perfect. I mean, look at sweet little Joseph and Mary. As sweet and as young and as innocent as they were, they had flaws. I mean, they lost Jesus. They forgot Jesus. They weren't perfect parents. Luke chapter uh, 2, verse 41, it says, Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. Uh, when he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Come on. Thinking he was with their company, they traveled for a day. Then they began to look, looking for him and among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days! Three days. Now we're talking four days, okay? Because it was a day after they traveled. In three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. They lost the Messiah, the Son of God. They weren't perfect parents. God didn't chastise them. God didn't say, oh, I can't believe you lost them. No. But let me tell you something. How many times do you think after that, that festival... Every year when they went back, guess what? They were, is he with us? If we're traveling back home, is he with us? Right? Do a head count. Is Jesus with us? All the other kids with us? We lost anybody? Make sure you do a head count. Now I'm gonna give us, I'm gonna give them kind of a eight out of ten, right? They lost the Messiah, so they weren't perfect. They still got a passing grade. But parents, it's hard. Raising your kids as they get older can even be more challenging. But let's face it. There's tension between kids and parents, right? Because they want their independence. They want to do their own thing. Teenage years, I mean, it can be tough. It can be tough because you're setting boundaries. You're setting rules and regulations, just like God did in his work. God was telling the Israelites, I'm giving you these commands. I'm giving me, you these, these things I want you to obey. And why do we give our, our kids rules? Why do we give them curfews? Why do we give them 
things that we, because we want to teach them, right? We want what's better for them. We want to teach them that chores aren't going to kill you, right? We want to teach them the good things. We want to teach them that it's going to be okay to have boundaries. It's okay to have certain things. But there's no shortage of parents and children's strife in the Bible. Civil rivalry um, and parents that had favorites. I mean, I was my mom's favorite, by the way, not to brag or anything, but I was my mom's favorite. Even though I'm an only child, I was my mom's favorite, right? I was her, I was her most challenging child, and I was her best child. Okay. Why? Because I was the only one. Couldn't blame it on the dog either, right? Everything I did, I had no, what was I going to do? Something got broke, it was me. Now, like Jacob and Esau, though, there was competition. If you look at Joseph, he was the favorite of his brothers. I mean, his dad, Isaac, even made him a coat of many colors. He was dad's favorite. How do you think that his other brothers felt, right? They were jealous. They were like, what? Why is he the favorite? And Joseph didn't help things any, though. Because he bragged that he had a coat of many colors that his dad got him. Look at me. Look at what dad got me. And, and then, of course, the brothers were definitely envy and jealous and angry and mad. Then you look at King David, and he had to run from his own son, Absalom, who wanted the kingdom. He wanted the crown. He wanted the throne. There's no shortage of parents that were bad influences in the Bible as well. Bad influences that taught their kids to idolatry, go after other things, go after worldly things. But then we have parents that were great examples. Hannah, mother of Samuel. Hannah's faith is one that was most inspiring in the Bible. One that was most notable is that Hannah offered her son Samuel for the service of God. She dedicated him to the temple. When he was a young age, she said, hey, Lord, I'm giving you this child. I'm, I want you to, he's yours. And that's what we have to do as parents. We have to say, you know what, Lord? I know maybe physically I have them. I know that um, I'm parenting them whether they're a kid, a small child, or an adult. But guess what? Ultimately, they're God's. They're God's kids, and you have to just let them go. You have to give them to God. You have to dedicate them to God and say, you know what, Lord? Maybe they're not living for you right now, but I'm praying that they are. Maybe they're not doing exactly what I think they should be doing, but I'm going to pray that somehow they get shook up and they take notice and know that you're a good, good God and you care for them and you love them and you want to see them prosper and you want to see them have a better life and have eternal salvation. Amen? And then we have the stepfather of Joseph. I mean, he did lose Jesus along with Mary, but he raised him and he taught him his own trade. And he also protected him because remember that when Jesus was a baby and, and he got that vision that, hey, they're coming to kill him. They're coming to kill all the boys. We need to get him out of here. And they fled to Egypt. He was a protector. As a parent, you need to be a protector. Then you look at the father of the prodigal son. He was keeping watch, waiting for his son to return. That He knew his son was living for the world. He knew his son just blew his inheritance. He didn't come back and lecture him. When he seen his son, what did he do? He embraced him. Same thing that God does with us. He embraces us because he wants the relationship to be healthy. He wants the relationship to be restored. As parents, things won't always make sense. And that's where our faith kicks in. That's where we have to know that God is on our side. That God's promises for our family is going to be true. Sometimes we as parents, we do the best we can, and then we just pray. And what do you do after that? Guess what? You pray some more. 
and you just keep praying because that's all that's all you got. And you say, God, I'm giving them to you. And as children, we must follow the Lord's commands to honor your father and mother. Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you in your life, or well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on earth, on the earth. Fathers, do not expirate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instructions of the Lord. The only commandment with a promise, honor your mother and father. You might not agree with them, but you need to honor them. You need to respect them. Still have healthy boundaries. And I'm going to say that throughout this Thing. If you want healthy relationships, you got to have healthy boundaries. Honor them, even if you don't disagree, or even if you don't agree with them. But you need to make sure that you don't abandon the relationship. Maybe they've abandoned you. Maybe they've walked out on you. But guess what? You keep praying. You believe that God can restore. Because God can restore. That prodigal father, I mean, he... He probably thought, well, my son just went, he just took half of his inheritance, or the half of the inheritance, he's gone, he's, I don't know if I'll ever see him. He's living a wild, crazy life. The Bible doesn't tell us in scripture that he was praying, but if the father was standing there waiting for the son to come home, don't you think he was praying? If he was praying, we should be praying. Sometimes it hurts, though, when we have these voids in our life, when we have these voids in our relationships with our parents or our children. The only thing we can do is we need to know that God can fill that void. Until that relationship is restored, that God can fill it. That miracles do happen. As long as we got breath in our lungs, God has an opportunity to restore relationships with our children, with our parents, with family members. We still need to keep those healthy boundaries, but we need to realize, and I love this, this quote by Martin Luther King. It says, forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is an attitude, right? You just can't say it's a one and done because you need to, it needs to be a mindset, all right? You can't say, oh, I, just, I forgive you. Because usually what happens if you just, Say that out loud. Time goes by, guess what? You didn't forget about it. And you bring it up, or they bring it up. And this takes us to family. You know, those other relatives, either related by blood or marriage or adoption or legal guardian. Um, ones that are close to us, but sometimes we only see them at family reunions. You know, those, those times when you have family reunions and there's like, there's Uncle Eddie. He's crazy. I'm staying away from him. Right? Everybody has little billies, and they have Uncle Eddie's in their family. You need to make sure that you work on those relationships, too. Now, in my previous law enforcement days, I have witnessed truly some sad situations, though. Family feuds that sparked from trivial things. Sometimes you'll, you'll talk to family members and be like, well, why don't you talk to your brother or your uncle or, or this one or that one? And you'll find out it was something stupid. It was a, just a, a trivial little fight or disagreement. I actually went to a, a fight one time because it wasn't just jealousy or anger or greed. It was over football. An uncle and a nephew got into a fist fight, and actually, the uncle pulled out a switchblade and stabbed the nephew because of a football game. Something that you can't control, yet that relationship was broken before the football game. It has to be, because nothing, you, it doesn't. I know alcohol was probably involved in that, but I'm going to tell you right now. The devil had already been working on that relationship. The devil had already been tearing that relationship apart. 
that family dynamic. We just have to keep praying and know that God can turn things around. Now, I know that football is really big, and it's really big in the South. Because I'm a Florida Gator fan, and my lovely wife is a Florida State fan. And we're a house divided when it comes to football. Okay, <laughs> We are a house divided. And in 17 years, I've been praying. Okay, so, and I'm going to keep praying. Because 17 years, I've been praying, Lord, let her see the way. Let her see that there is a better team. Lord, that... And okay, we haven't got we haven't gotten in fights, okay. But I'm, what I'm saying is, houses that are divided, sometimes people are gonna, just going to be stubborn. Sometimes they're just going to, and you just got to keep praying. You just got to keep praying. And I pray that she sees that the Florida Gators are better. And I'll just keep praying and pray for me, okay? I know she's praying for the same way, and, it, and our, our prayers are, are canceling each other out. I'm not sure what's going on. The Lord sees, though. Um, but we have to ask ourselves, why in our family relationships, why do we let things go? Why? Because time doesn't heal things. If we're not talking to somebody and we're we have this strife between them, we think, uh, I'll give it some time. I'll give it six months and then I'll talk to them. But guess what happens after six months? Usually don't reach out to them, they don't reach out to you. And those months become years. And those years become decades. And those voids in our life that were we're hurting and we want to have a relationship with this person, this family member. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a parent. We don't know what to do. The good thing is that most of the time, these family members that we have, whether they're under the same roof or not, when you set these boundaries, you still have boundaries. Even if you restore a relationship, there still has to be healthy boundaries. But what we can learn is that we can consume some fruit salad, right? The next family reunion, I'm not talking about Aunt Pat's fruit salad. I'm talking about Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 26. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Jesus or Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passion and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoked, envying each other. Why do we do that? We do that with our family, the ones closest to us. We do that with our kids, and we do that with our parents. Why do we push people away when really down deep inside we want a close relationship with them? Now I understand that there's going to be family members, just like I said last, last week, there's other people that sometimes they don't need to be in your circle. they got to be away from you for your physical and mental health. But I believe God wants to restore relationships. Don't think a relationship is too far gone for God. If you would stand with me. Maybe the rest of your family is running from the Lord and maybe you've got some little billies or big billies sitting at your dining room table. Maybe they don't have a filter. Maybe they have a dirty filter. And you don't know what's going to come out of their mouth. Maybe you got some family members that try to take advantage of you because you're a family. 
You have to set your limits, and you can't you can't expose yourself. But you also sometimes you you push away from the family because you don't want the family shenanigans. So you say, you know what? I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna participate in that. I'm not going to that. And you might be called the black sheep of the family, but let me tell you something. Nowhere in Scripture did I read that the good shepherd classified the color of a sheep. We just have to keep praying. And guess what? We have to pray that God will go after that one family member, those two family members, or five, doesn't matter. God doesn't have a limit. You've got to keep praying. And like I said before, be their constant. No matter what's going through, no matter what chaos is going on in your family, be the constant in your family. You have a Heavenly Father that can intervene and work on your behalf and do far more than we could ever do on our own. Amen? He cares about unifying the family, reuniting our family members. Maybe this week, I want to encourage someone, maybe this week it's a, a phone call to that family member you haven't talked to in years. Maybe it's, maybe it's a knock on the door. Maybe they're across the country. Maybe it's old-fashioned, send a letter. Whatever it is, God can restore because he is a God of restoration. And he wants to see healthy families. He wants to see families. And he wants to see parents pouring into their children and their children for generations to come. I'm going to ask my beautiful wife to come up here. And she's going to pray a blessing and a prayer for us and our families. Because I believe that God wants us to walk out of here empowered. That we can, we can have restored relationships no matter what. Whether our kids, our parents, other family members, it doesn't matter. He loves you, and he loves them. And there should be no reason that we should let the devil win. Father God, we just come to you, Father God, today, Lord, and we thank you for this word, Father God, that you departed into our spirits, Lord Jesus. Father God, we come right now, Father, and we lift up families, Father. God, families that are represented in this house today, Father God, families that are watching online, Father God, we lift up families to you, Father God. We lift up our children to you, Father. You see the families, Father God, that are, have strife going on right now, Lord God. You see the families that are distant, Father God, for whatever reason, Lord God. And we know, Father God, that you are a God that is a God that restores. Doors. And so, Lord God, today we pray, Father God, that whatever the cause was, Father God, whatever the root of the problem that brought distance in families, Father God, that you would come and you would be a God that restores, a God that redeems that family, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that we can come to you and bring our family, Lord, and we can lay them at the altar, Father God, and that you can bring our families back together, Lord. I pray, Father God, today for the children, Father God, that are away, God, the children that have walked away from your word, God. Lord, we ask that you would bring them back, Lord Jesus. Lord, that you would restore their soul, Father God. You will restore their life back to you, Jesus. Lord, I pray, Father God, for the parents in the house today, Father. Lord, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us, Lord God, to rise up, Lord God, to be, Lord God, your example of a, a parent, of what you've called us to do, Father. Lord God, to have love, to have patience, Lord God, to, Lord God, to lead, Father God, in a way that would be pleasing to you, Father. Lord God, I just pray, Father God, a blessing, Lord God, as we go out this week, Father God, that we'll make that phone call. Lord, we'll send that letter, Lord Jesus, to that family member that there's distance there, God. We'll start, Father God, the journey, Father 
Father God, of the restoration, God, knowing that you are going before us, Lord God, and you make crooked place straight, Father. And we thank you, Father. We ask you just to bless families, God, and restore them, Father, in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen and amen. Now, if you're today, or you're watching online, you say, you know what? I don't have a relationship with Jesus, but I want one. I want to change my status. I'm going to give you that opportunity today. All you have to do is close your eyes, bow your heads, and everyone say with me, say, Heavenly Father, I believe that your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for my sins. But on the third day, he rose from that grave and is alive today. Lord, I ask you into my heart. I will live all the days of my life for you. In Christ's name we pray. Everyone said, Amen and Amen. Can we give God a hand clap of praise? And if you said that very simple prayer, contact us at the email below. And let us know that you made that decision today. We have some great resources we want to place in your hands. God is celebrating, and God wants to celebrate restoration in our families. Amen. Amen.